The unicorn card, can the balance be increased based on how much you add to it? My first intuition on that is no. However, on their website, it says that the more you use it, the more that um, the higher your credit limit goes and it goes up to 25,000. But a few weeks ago, I called and asked and actually it was on January 1st. I called January 1st and it was like nine o'clock at night or something. And the person was overseas and nothing, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It just means they might not be the most informed person when it comes to how the system works. Because look, same thing with my, my business. If you call regular customer service, and you talk to one of my people and you start asking them advanced tax questions and business credit questions, they're just gonna say, I don't know, talk to Vanessa or talk to Rondi, because those are the two that do that. So I suspect that it has to do with the person I talked to because right on their website, it does say that under their optimized plan, that the more you spend, the more you use, the higher your credit limit goes. Maybe once you get the account, you can call and ask yourself or try it, try it out. Uh, so Heather has a really good question. Let me get on business credit. How many tier one cards should I get? So the tier one accounts, you need to have at least three to five tier one accounts. So I would say get at least five. So tier one. So you go into fortresscreditpro.com. You click on active clients. In fact, let me load that screen up for you guys. When you go to fortresscreditpro.com, you're going to click on active clients right here and you scroll down to where it says business credit portal. And then it's going to take you to this. When you log in here, so again, I went to fortresscreditpro.com, active client, I clicked on this business credit portal. If you are a business credit client, you can schedule your monthly review here. You can also schedule the business credit reviews there. So you click on business credit. As long as you've checked all of this stuff off, you can log in. Once you log in, you're going to go in here and you're gonna start going through your lender compliance, optimized reporting, all of this, and then you're gonna start building business credit. Starter net 30 accounts. You're gonna go through and start building it out. When you're in there, the tier one, two, and three accounts, those are what, uh, those are your starter net 30s. And that's who reports to Dun & Bradstreet. That's how you get your paydex score. You wanna have at least an 85 paydex score before you go out and start doing stuff. 85 is the same as having an 850 FICO. The difference is it only takes three to six months to build an 85 paydex versus 20 years to build an 850 FICO. It takes 20 years for an 850 FICO. Three to six months for an 850 FICO equivalent, otherwise known as paydex. So you want to have at least five accounts that you apply for. That way, at least three of them are reporting and as long as you have three of them reporting and you're using them, you bought something, you got a bill, you waited a couple of days, then you paid off the bill. Then as long as you do that a couple of times, you'll have a paid X score. So to answer Heather's question, how many should you have? I recommend at least five tier one accounts. Can you show where the video is that you walk through the business credit stuff? It's inside where you are right now, Heather, back in October when I did them. And all I did back in October, and Vanessa and Chastney also did them, is we literally just went in here and we just said, okay, here's what you do. You go to this one and you fill out this. And so it's literally us just walking through. But if you go into member.fortresscreditpro.com, that's where you log in for the business credit portal. And then inside Chastney, it's under... It's either in Fortress University. I think it's here in the Facebook page as well, but it's back in October. It was right, right there, portal walkthrough. There it is. So Fortress Credit Pro portal walkthrough. I didn't know she even created that. So that's cool. That's the nice thing when you have winners on your team, they do things and you don't even know about. What do I do if my vendor cards aren't reporting? E e Quill. So with Quill, you got to make purchases with Quill and all of them, you have to make a purchase. And you generally have to make a couple purchases. If you just do one, they're not going to report. They make their money. The reason that they have these accounts and the reason that people are willing to pay extra couple dollars for a you know a roll of um, paper towels, because look, you can go to Costco and buy the paper towels cheaper. In fact, one of my students said this the other day, his bookkeeper, some in the office said, you know, we don't have to buy our paper from Office Depot. We can get it a dollar cheaper through Costco. And Shannon said, I know. But then Office Depot reports it and Costco doesn't. 
So that's why we're paying the extra dollar per box for 5,000 pages. So what's an extra dollar? So that's why we're paying an extra dollar for the box of paper so they report it to the bureau. So in order to get Quill to report, you have to make purchases from them and you need to do it on the net 30. Sometimes they will uh, ask you if you wanna pay with the debit card. If you pay with the debit card, they'll never report. You have to use the net 30 accounts. So five tier one accounts, that will get the business pay decks. Yes, five accounts generally will get you with at least three of them reporting. Cause sometimes, sometimes they don't report every month. So say you miss the reporting date or whatever. So that's why we recommend five and then you get at least three. Now, the advantage of having five other than reporting is when someone pulls your business credit report, they'll see that you have multiple open trade lines and they're all paid as agreed. So that actually helps you quite a bit. Sadie, I saw a question here. Oh, someone else. Let's go this one. What are the qualifications to apply for Amex? Is it okay if current cards are maxed out late and how long do negative items have to be on my report? So the qualifications are, you need to have at least a 700 credit score. That's number one, at least a 700. Now, will they go down below that? Yes, they will. However, I do know that they there's a much, much higher chance of you being approved at 700 than at 640. So there's so many different factors. But for the most part, 700. No active collections, no active charge-offs. If your credit cards are maxed out, that's fine. American Express doesn't care much. If you got a bunch of inquiries, American Express doesn't care that much either. It's really credit score, revenue coming in, so deposits, and no active collections and charge-offs. So get you up to 700, then you should be good. The Platinum class is going to be the end of March. So let me pull that up. So the end of March, um, I'm trying to figure out the dates right now. But it's either going to be the end of March, 1st of April. So somewhere in there. I'm working on the dates. As soon as I get those locked in to make sure I have the space that I want, I'll let you guys know. But it'll be towards the end of March, beginning of April. All right. So Lorinda says, cool looking toys. They're good cars. That Ferrari, guys, um, I use the Fortress banking system on it. That's a 12-year loan. 12 year loan on that Ferrari. And I just made my last payment five and a half years early. Five and a half years early, no extra, excuse me, no extra payments. I made the same payment every, excuse me, made the same payment every single month. But instead of taking 12 years to pay it off in thousands upon thousands of dollars in interest, I paid it off five and a half years early. If you want to know how I did it, Go into Side Fortress University and watch the Fortress banking system. Doing the same thing on the truck, doing the same thing on the airplane, doing the same thing on the Jeep. I use my credit. I'm not a person that says, you know, use credit and then I pay cash for everything. I, I leverage it. I mean, look, if I can get a loan at 2% interest on a car that depreciates, I'm not going to take money out of my checking account or away from my investments. So I would rather get a loan for a vehicle that depreciates and use that cash. Instead of getting a loan, I use the cash for an investment and the interest from the investment ends up paying for the loan. And then I eliminate 70% of the interest by applying the Fortress banking system that I teach inside the system. Uh, the 12-year loan, that's through um, Woodside and most of the, um, I, I don't lease cars. Most of the guys that you see driving around these cars, the influencers, they're all renting those cars, their leases. Uh, I, I don't do that. I, I buy them. But um, that's through, 12-year loan is through Woodside. But usually when you get in the exotics and the airplanes, like the airplane's a 20-year loan and it's almost paid off. Um, I've had it now 10 years. It should be paid off this year. Again, I'm not making extra payments. I'm simply just applying the Fortress banking system to it. So Fortress banking system. So the Platinum Business Workshop is three days in Las Vegas. And what it's going to be is <clears throat> everything you learn inside the portal 
and everything you learn inside of Fortress University. I'm going to cover that. And I'm going to cover some stuff that got me sued for sharing. So when I bought that Ferrari, I didn't pay sales tax on it. And I, not knowing any better, got on Facebook and taught people how to do the same thing. And the next thing you know, I get served and I get sued by the state of Nevada for tax evasion in a state that doesn't have taxes, income taxes. And come to find out, they didn't want people to know. It's kind of like ivermectin. It's kind of like that. The deep state, the government, if you say things and teach things they don't want you to share, they try to, they silence you by suing you or throwing you in jail. Fortunately for me, I just got sued. I beat them. And then they sued me for something else, for filming. I beat them on the sales tax thing because what I shared was true. So then they sued me for not paying film use tax, essentially film tax, because I was filming a video for profit, making a movie essentially in Las Vegas without a permit. So my attorney said, you know what, just pay them because they're never going to quit. They're going to find something else. So I ended up paying them. Still a lot less than the sales tax, by the way. So what does it entail? It entails other things that you can write off that I am not going to say here. There's some really cool things that you can do in back advanced tax strategies and business strategies for business funding. I won't say it here because I learned my lesson, but I will do it personally because you can't record at the event. Okay. So that's what it tells. Can you recommend any strategy separating business and personal credit for tax purposes? Yeah. So here's the thing with that. Here's the rule. And they say that rules are meant to be broken. This one's not meant to be broken. This is a rule that I will say you never break this rule. And whenever you say always, never, those kind of words, there's always an exception, right? In this rule, there is no exception. You do not co-mingle business funds with personal funds. There is no reason to do it. There's none. I don't care what you say, what you ask. I'm going to say this all every single time. No, you never, ever co-mingle personal business or personal account with business account. You never put them together in the same checking account. You never put them on the same credit card. Never. Now, you might be doing it and your CPA might say it's okay, but I'm telling you, you never do that. Because if you mix the accounts together, if you commingle the accounts, it breaks the corporate veil and it will increase the likelihood of you being audited. So generally when you're audited, it's you personally that gets audited from the IRS. It is extremely rare for a business, an S corporation file taxes filed by a professional CPA or law firm, extremely rare. For a business to get audited, what happens almost every time is the individual tax return gets audited and there was something on the personal income tax during the audit that just looked a little off and maybe it was commingling a credit card. Something went wrong and so it triggers an audit now for the businesses. So you never commingle personal and business expenses. So my recommendation of strategies of separating business and personal is you open a business bank account and a personal bank account. You get a business credit card and a personal credit card. If you don't have the ability to get a business credit card yet, you get a business or you get a personal credit card and another personal credit card and you only put business expenses on the personal credit card. So look, I'll give you an example. This is, this is a business credit card. I don't know if you can see that. Oops, this way. This is my debt settlement company, DYD. That is a business credit card. It doesn't show up on my personal credit. Yes, there's a personal guarantee. However, just because there's a personal guarantee, it's still a um, business credit card. So this one is a business credit card. This, however, this American Express card, this platinum card, this is actually a personal credit card. So this is personal. This one's business. You need to keep them separate. Now, this one is a personal credit card. And the reason I'm blanking that out or put my finger there is because it's got the numbers. This is actually a personal credit card, but I use it for Credit Mojo. So this is a personal card. In my personal name has nothing to do with Credit Mojo, but I use it 
for Credit Mojo. And the only charge that goes on this card every month is my personal Credit Mojo bill for monitoring. And it's 25 bucks a month, goes on the account. It's set up on automatic payment, so it pays itself off in full every month through my Credit Mojo bank account. But it's a personal credit card, but I'm using it for business expenses. And the reason I have Credit Mojo on there and nothing else is because I do what I teach. I teach you, you should use your credit cards, every single one of them, every single month for small bills. And so that credit card has a $25,000 credit limit somewhere in there. And I put 25 bucks a month on it. That's it. And it's only Credit Mojo. Nothing else goes on that credit card. And then Credit Mojo pays it off. So the IRS does not care that it's personally in my name. They only care about who's paying the bill and what is the bill. So great question, Sadie. So my recommendation of separating it is keep it separate. It's kind of like, no, the strategy, how do you, how do you keep your man from cheating on you? What's the strategy? And my, my good friend, Brad is doing a lot of these right now. Uh, he did one this morning. Brad Lee is one of my best friends. He, the post I saw this morning was, how does your wife handle you? Uh, how does your wife handle you in the public? And he's like, what do you mean? Like, does she get jealous? And he's like, my wife doesn't get jealous that I'm out in the public and I have a big Instagram following. So it's kind of like that. How do you manage not cheating on your spouse? You just don't do it. Really good question, Sadie. And the reason why it's such a good question is the majority of business owners do it. And I bet if I put money on it, I bet the majority of you on here right now are doing it. You're commingling your funds. Do not commingle funds. And you will rarely ever hear me say, never do something. But that is one of them. You never commingle funds. Thank you, Sadie. Heather says they always say lease. Yeah, dealerships want you to see. They want you to lease. Salespeople love you to lease. Why? They make more money. Why do you think banks tell you, don't go over 30% on your credit cards? And I tell you five. What's the difference between me and a bank? I was certified and trained by FICO. I'm certified and trained by FICO. They're not. They make money off of interest. I don't. Not in these, not in what I'm talking about right now. Car dealerships, car salesmen will tell you to always lease because it's always about the payment. I'll tell you leasing a car is the most expensive way you'll ever buy a car. Here's the messed up part. The part that they don't know. I was on stage a couple of years ago. Guys like um, David Goggins and Patrick Bet David and Grant Cardone and Brad Lee was there. A bunch of other guys were there. And one of the guys, I won't say his name here, but he's got two Ferraris and two Rolls Royces. And he, he talks about his cars all the time, how he treats them like prostitutes and he uses them. And, but he rents them. He tells everybody he buys them, but he doesn't. He leases them. I know because I've seen his credit report. He leases them. So he rents them. So we were talking one day in the green room. He's like, yeah, it's a great write-off. I get to write all these cars off and it's, you know, it's whatever. It's four grand, five grand per car. So it's like $25,000, $30,000 a month he's paying for these stupid cars. Stupid because he's, he's just renting them. They're great cars, though. I'd rather buy a two-year-old Rolls Royce and save a half a million dollars or 200 grand than buy a brand new one and say that I own it when I actually rent it. But So he was bragging about how much money he saves on his taxes because of these cars. Here's the thing. When it comes to luxury cars, if you lease them, you don't get the full write-off. It's capped at eight. I think it's 18000 I have to see what it changed to this year. It was 18000 last year. So if your lease is $4,000 a month for your Rolls Royce or your Bentley or Ferrari or Lamborghini, you only get to write off 18,000 of it for the year. The rest of it comes back on as income. You only get to write that off if you buy it. Then you get to write off the depreciation and the interest. So if you're a business owner, it almost always makes more sense to buy the vehicle, especially if it's a luxury or exotic car, 
because when you lease an exotic or luxury car, so a Cadillac Escalade would be luxury, most likely you can't write it all off anyway. So I don't recommend leasing. I'm going to pull this up. I think I already answered this, but yeah. So I think I answered that, but just in case I didn't. It is completely okay to use personal credit cards for business expenses, but never put personal expense on the card that you're using for business purposes. So if you have a personal credit card, and you're going to use that as your business credit card. You cannot put a personal expense on it. For example, if you go and get a biz, a personal credit card and you use that for your Facebook ads and then you go and put Netflix on it and then you go and put a roll of toilet paper on it or you put your electricity bill on it and you're now commingling those funds, it's bad. Always keep it separate. Now, if you had a personal card and you used to use it for personal stuff and now you're going to use it for business, then from that point forward, never use it for personal. Only use it for business. And you can have that happen, but you you just cannot just throughout the year just co-mingle that stuff because it will cause a problem for you. I have an EIN for every single business. So I have uh, six tax returns plus my personal. So it's seven tax returns every year. Thank you, Sadie. Yeah, so I I have EINs for every business that I have because they're S-Corps, C-Corps, or LLCs taxed as S-Corps. That's another thing you'll learn at the Platinum program is why you want to have a C-Corp. Because having a C-Corp, is a lifesaver when you start actually making quite a bit of money and you have a tax problem. A C-Corp is a way to eliminate that tax problem. 